Excellent. So I uh, welcomed Amy right at the start of the meeting, but let me give a proper introduction. I mentioned that Amy is a CIS alumna. Amy has both an undergraduate and a postgraduate from CIS. Amy's currently the interim global editor at the Fuller Project, and previously she was Moscow correspondent for the Washington Post, and uh, she's also led coverage or been a staff reporter for, the, for foreign policy, for the Wall Street Journal, and for Reuters. Today, Amy's going to talk to us about changing attitudes towards women in Russia, uh, including, as I mentioned at the start, in relation to domestic violence, but also specifically regarding the Me Too movement. Although, Amy, feel free to, to rip that up and speak about whatever uh, you would like within that broad area. I'm sure whatever you say will be fascinating. If you could talk, Amy, please, for around 20 minutes, we can then shift to Q&A. I realise that some people will have to leave at two o'clock, uh, but for those of you who uh, can stay beyond two o'clock, we will continue the Q&A beyond there. So uh, as many people as possible can ask Amy questions. So without further ado, Amy, I will hand over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you. And it's, it's wonderful to be speaking um, at CIS, uh, even though we are all, uh, even though it's virtual, um, <laughs> such in these times. But um, no, um, uh, I loved my time at CIS and it's so great to see people um, still, well, still interested in the region, uh, just as we were so long ago. Um, Great, so I guess how I was gonna frame this is um, by talking about Russia in two different stages. And I am going to talk only about Russia because, um, as opposed to other countries here, because that's, um, that's really, uh, well, that's my expertise and that's where I lived. Um, so I am a journalist. I did two big postings in Russia. The first one was in 2007, which was with Reuters and that lasted almost five years, um, then I went away and uh, went to Afghanistan, London, uh, California, did other journalism things. And then I went back to Russia with foreign policy and the Washington Post in 2016, right before Trump got elected. Um, and that was the second posting. And I see, uh, and I just left last December um, to, come, to come back to London and, um, why I want to talk about these sort of two different Russias is because um, I feel like a massive shift happened when, when it came to women between the first posting and the second posting. And I remember um, so clearly on maybe it was my first or second day back in Russia in 2016, I noticed that lots of young women were wearing flat shoes. Now, this may sound flippant um, and completely anti-feminist of me and irrelevant to point out, but I, I found it absolutely fascinating and extremely indicative of the changes that, um, that we've been seeing that have been going on in Russia, that uh, for those of you who visited Russia 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and their surrounding countries, um, women wearing flat shoes was something that you pretty much never saw. Uh, women uh, are, are often dressed to the nines um, and there's a whole thing going on there to do with, um, you know, making yourself uh, attractive for men, um, uh, something which we do not do as much uh, in the West. And, but, um, so I saw all these young women wearing flat shoes. The next thing I noticed was that many of them had badges on their backpacks. Um, of feminist symbols um, and even saying things like yeah feministka and um, I mean and I was just kind of like whoa I mean this completely blew my mind because as a student in Russia right after C or during my time at CIS um, the word feminist was met uh, was treated if you said you were a feminist well if you said it to a man they just laugh and say oh you mean you're a lesbian um, and if you said it to a woman um, they'd get quite angry at you um, and say you were ungrateful and that you didn't understand how wonderful men were. Um, and so and, and so to kind of fast forward 20 years and see how much Russia had changed and how the attitudes of young women had changed, to me was absolutely shocking. Um, and of course, I welcomed it. Um, and so I thought, okay, things are really, really changing here. Um, so we're seeing this feminist movement um, pretty nascent feminist movement when we compare it to what we see obviously in the UK where it's long established. Um, but nevertheless, something was happening there. And what was very interesting about this is this feminist movement ran parallel 
to something else which was happening, which was a darkening, um, a shrinking of women's rights, which was coming from, from the very top, from the Kremlin. Uh, Putin, who, uh, of course, uh, you know, Putin's um, bravado and, and, and machismo and brogadachu and what have you, um, was famous around the world, um, as you all know. I mean, even my Dutch mother-in-law loves seeing pictures of Putin um, um, nuzzling up to, to a tiger that's, that he's kind of shot with a stun gun. And, you know, and um, uh, that kind of image of Putin all over the world um, was often seen as quite ridiculous and funny. Um, but what happened in recent years, what happened in 2016 in the, um, is that Putin's machismo stopped being something only for calendars um, and instead it started to become policy. And that's when things became incredibly dark. And what I mean by this is something very specific was in February of 2017, a law was passed, which Putin signed off on. Well, he has to sign off on all laws, um, which was the decriminalization or the partial decriminalization of domestic violence. This uh, was a long time coming. This, um, there was a cohort of extremely conservative actors in the Duma, who had been pushing this for some years uh, with no success. Uh, the church, the increasingly powerful Russian Orthodox Church, had also been pushing for this to happen, and it actually did happen in uh, February of 2017. And um, it's a story which is, it's an enormous story, and of course all the journalists covered it, um, And but there's so much more to it than the fact that they simply uh, decriminalized it. And so in case you're unfamiliar with the law, I'll just very briefly say what it is. Um, so there was no law previously, um, there was no domestic violence law of any kind actually in Russia. Russia is one of a handful of countries in the whole world, most of them are in sub-Saharan Africa, which do not have a specific law um, against domestic violence. They do not have a specific part of their, um, of their, of their legal framework which bans domestic violence. Um, so what Russia did was they softened the battery, um, the battery charge, and they allow what they allowed, uh, allowing, essentially in a nutshell, they allowed women to be beaten up by their partners, uh, by their husbands, brothers, um, anyone really. Um, and I say women because it is women in 99% of the cases in Russia. Um, and how they did this was they said, you can only, beat them up or <laughs> you can only beat them up if you do not do lasting damage um, and, and if it's um, the first time you're doing it. So unless a concussion has happened or you've chopped someone's leg off and that has happened, um, then it's fine. If you've got, if, if you've beaten someone up and they've got um, blood coming out, but they just need a few stitches. If you've pulled their hair out, if you've uh, beaten someone to the black and blue, all of that counts as not lasting damage. So therefore that would be legal. Um, if it is deemed to be lasting damage, I think the fine was in the area of uh, somewhere around 150 to $500. So even if you do um, manage to do something uh, worse than what we've just uh, discussed, the penalty is not very large. So what this did is it sent an immediate message to all of Russian society as coming from the top where, where everything comes from in Russia when you want um, in, in terms of laws but in terms of how attitudes um, want what people want attitudes to be projected which is women are worth less than they were before we passed this law um, so that is what happened it was absolutely awful uh, there were marches against it. I, I went to protests against this shivering in minus 30 um, in Moscow. Uh, the, you know, there were women from all walks of life. There were women who had survivors of domestic abuse. There were a few men as well. There were a few allies who were coming out and trying to get the government to, to reverse this. Um, to little avail, although I'll talk about that a bit later because there is some, there is some movement on that. Um, and running parallel again to this, or in, in the background of this, was an incredibly well-organized anti-abortion movement, which um, 
probably the biggest Russia has has seen ever. Um, and this, of course, came from the church and it got backing from the Kremlin. Um, it was um, sponsored by lots of Duma deputies who came out and said that they supported the, um, the potential ban on abortion and also that they supported, of course, it's, it's worth mentioning that the ban on abortion and the potential ban on abortion and the decriminalization of domestic violence law go together because they're under what the church believes in strengthening the family. And if you strengthen the family, you strengthen Mother Russia. Um, so it's actually a patriotic act. Um, so essentially beating up your wife uh, means you're fulfilling your patriotic duty, um, which is, um, uh, that's that's quite that's quite something um and so there were these anti-abortion um groups many of them affiliated with churches uh, going around the country trying to convince doctors trying to convince midwives um and oncologists or sorry not oncologists um to 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 stop the practice to kind of join them in being rebels and to stop this uh, they did succeed in quite a few places especially in the far east which uh, has the highest number of abortions in the country per capita. And there's various reasons for that. Mostly it's to do um, with poverty, um, lack of opportunity and lack of medical services. Um, Putin was asked on one of his, you know, end of year press conferences. I, I put that in quotes because um, there's, <laughs> those questions are all pre-chosen. It's not really a press conference. Um, he was asked about abortion and he came out as pro-choice, which was a massive, a massive blow to the anti-abortion movement, a massive blow to the church's efforts. Um, and um, it was pleasant, um, it was a pleasant surprise um, to, to millions and millions of women. So, so that happened. It doesn't mean that, um, that this campaign is, is not happening. So this is to give you an idea of what's been happening in Russia, this, this darkness um, against women um, and the, 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 the atmosphere in which people are operating right now. Um, and in parallel to that, though, was this burgeoning feminist movement. And um, as I said earlier, being called a feminist used to be such a bad word. And I just couldn't believe walking around the streets of Moscow in 2016, that being a feminist was a cool thing. Um, and that even men, uh, I mean, just Russian men were even identifying as feminists. I mean, granted, these are men in um, places like Moscow and St. Petersburg, but still things were changing. Um, the Me Too movement was very, very slow to come to Russia, but it did actually make its way over. Uh, when the Me Too movement first broke um, or first started in the United States, uh, Russia, Russia responded to it with, with, with scorn, uh, they mocked it. There was a group of Russian women who stripped completely naked in front of the US embassy. Um, I think in, uh, yeah, it was in late November. So it was very, very cold. And they were holding up signs saying, Weinstein, you're, you're welcome to Russia. Uh, Russian actresses, quite well-known Russian actresses went on record saying, uh, you know, as we saw Catherine Deneuve say actually in France, you know, um, oh, all these all these actresses who who claim they were abused by Weinstein just need to grow up, you know, like um, having having to perform sexual favors to a powerful man is, is, you know, that's normal. That's that's all. That's what it's about. So who are these women complaining? That was the initial Russian reaction. It was made fun of on um, the state TV networks. It was, um, um, you know, even it went everywhere. You'd, you'd, you'd be in a, um, in a taxi some going somewhere and they would ask you, you know, what do you think about this, this nonsense going on in America? Um, and, uh, but then things started to change because there was an accusation against Leonid Slutsky, who is a lawmaker. Um, and I think three women, well, one at first and then three women came out and uh, accused him of harassment. And it basically released the flood. Um, all sorts of women and uh, then started to come out and talk about being harassed by, by other important or famous men. Um, no, none as, as big as Slutsky, but what, did, what we did begin to see was the word damagatelstva, harassment, appeared out of nowhere in, um, in, in the Russian language. Obviously it was there before, but suddenly it was 
everywhere and people were learning about it and writing it um, and it was making headlines um, and it was kind of like a conversation was happening uh, which was I mean I just found it absolutely fascinating and so after the Slutsky incident um, which he responded terribly to actually he boasted about how he how he got how he got these women um, after the Slutsky incident, there were a few, there were some high-profile uh, domestic violence incidents, which um, started to change Russian public opinion, public perception as um, as to the treatment of women. One was the woman Margarita Grachova. I wrote a story about her. My last story before I left uh, Moscow, actually last year, she um, was taken into a forest by her husband, and he chopped off her hands with an ax. Um, uh, he tried to chop off her legs too, but didn't succeed. Uh, um, being the Russian winter, one of the hands was preserved in the ice and was uh, reattached. Uh, the other one she lost forever, but she has a bionic hand. And she became a sort of poster girl um, against, um, against um, uh, sorry, against domestic violence. She wrote a book. She was constantly on television. She has a viral Instagram following. Um, so that happened. Uh, and the book, I must say, quite interestingly, was published by um, a state publisher. So once the state starts to get involved in things like that, and she was allowed onto state TV, I think that's when you can understand in Russia that perceptions are changing, that the government might be willing to actually... Um, except that it overstepped here, that it made a mistake, which it is beginning to realize. Um, the other major um, uh, awful thing that happened was three teenage girls in Moscow premeditatively killed their father who had been raping and abusing them for years. Um, that was uh, another case which was just met with huge protests across the country, actually, um, not just in Moscow. Um, and I think so when you've got these two cases that were happening and, and um, both cases are ongoing. Um, and then there was also a, a really high profile manager at um, Alpha Bank, you know, Russia's biggest bank, which, um, he got fired because uh, his wife accused him of um, of beating her up, and he actually got fired. There was actually um, you know, immediate action, which I think shocked quite a lot of Russians. So uh, the conversation, the feelings towards how women are treated, really started to change. And this is all in the last um, three or four years that we've seen this, and it's I mean it's continuing to change. Um, Right before I left, I went to um, the second ever Fiem Fist, uh, is what it was called, and it was held in this huge empty warehouse um, next to the te um, the old telegraph office in Moscow, if you know it. And it was full of women of all ages talking about body positivity, talking about um, sexual harassment, talking about um, vaginal health. Uh, there was even an installation of a vagina, which I just, <laughs> compared to the Russia that I studied in, is just, it's like two different worlds. Um, and there were a lot of discussions and it was all incredibly uh, open and therapeutic, uh, almost. Uh, there was even a play about Alexandra Kollontai, the famous um, early feminist. Um, and I just thought, wow, you know, Russia is changing. It's changing in a huge way when it comes when it comes to women. Um, and uh, I feel fortunate to have to have witnessed this. Um, yeah, is, I think have I come up to my twenty minutes? Um, oh, sorry, my alarm didn't. It's fast. It is, it is fascinating. I could ask you to continue for another 20 minutes, but in the interest, I know that there will be lots of questions from people in the group. So huge thanks, Amy, for that really fascinating view of uh, sort of points of tension to possible trajectories. And so I know what my question is going to be, but I'm going to hold on to that and ask members of the group either 